Hi, this is Dr. Michelle O'Donoghue reporting from Medscape. Joining me today is Dr. Akshay Desai. He's the director of the Heart Failure Program at Brigham Women's Hospital. And one of the interesting studies that's being presented here at ACC 2024 is the CARDIA study. And CARDIA is looking at an RNA interference medication that is being developed to target patients with refractory hypertension called Zilbicerin. Um, it's, it's a tough one to pronounce, perhaps. But let's talk a little bit about what Zilbicerin is um, and what it targets and, and how well it works. Absolutely. So, uh, so Michelle, Zalbitrin is a, uh, uh, an RNA interference therapeutic that's targeting hepatic angiotensinogen, which is the most upstream precursor in the retin angiotensin system and the sole precursor for all of the angiotensin peptides. So the concept is that by targeting hepatic production of angiotensinogen, that we can suppress about 90% of plasma levels of angiotensinogen. And if angiotensinogen is depleted, then all of the downstream metabolites, renin, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, then in theory should also be suppressed. So this is another approach uh, to complete suppression of the renin angiotensin system that is analogous uh, to some of the existing oral drugs we have in practice, angiotensin receptor blockers, ACE inhibitors, and renin inhibitors in terms of the mechanism. But because it acts more upstream, offers the potential for more complete suppression of the system, and then because it is an RNA interference therapeutic, the potential for a subcutaneous therapy with infrequent dosing and prolonged duration of action. Yeah, and to that point, it's a small interfering RNA, um, which allows it to have a more prolonged duration of action. So um, how frequent is the dosing for, for this? Uh... So the do dosing, which was worked out in phase one, is that when you give a single dose of subcutaneous zalbicerin, plasma angiotensinogen levels fall to a peak level of about 95 or 98% by week two. Um, and then they are sustained uh, and suppressed all the way out to six months with a single dose before the levels start to recover. Um, so with the 600 milligram dose, which was the dose that was chosen uh, for the CARDIA2 trial that we'll be discussing, the suppression of angiotensinogen is more than 95% for six months. So this is a, right now positioned as a twice annual medication. So it definitely has appeal for also patients who may not be very compliant with a daily medication regimen. And to be fair, I mean, some of these medication regimens can be very complicated if they have refractory hypertension and are on four or five different antihypertensives. Yeah, Michelle, I think this is one of the great things. We haven't seen a lot of innovation until recently in the hypertension space. And I think uh, one of the uh, great challenges we have is despite the availability of a lot of drugs to treat high blood pressure, some of which are generic and low cost, we don't do a great job of treating blood pressure, especially to the more aggressive targets that have recently been set by our guidelines. Um, and in fact, if we look in practice, uh, about 40% of patients uh, with diagnosed hypertension are not treated to guideline recommended targets. And that leaves a lot of residual risk on the table. So I think some of that is probably driven by a lot of factors, access to care, uh, social determinants of health, uh, maybe cost of medications. But some of it is, is, is that patients, even when prescribed medicines, don't take their medications. And then I think the other component is that physicians seeing patients in routine practice are prone to uh, uh, keep things as they are and maybe kick the can down the road a little bit with regard to blood pressure uh, and see if it persists in elevation before they act. So one of the great opportunities for a long-acting therapeutic uh, like an RNA interference therapeutic is the opportunity to overcome some of those adherence challenges and some of the inertia that happens on the physician side. And so what did the top-line results of CARDIA show? What are you learning? Right. So, so CARDIA-2 uh, is a follow-on trial to the first CARDIA trial, which was reported and published in the uh, JAMA or, uh, earlier this year. Um, in which patients with uh, uh, hypertension were washed out of their medicines and they randomized to treatment was albicin or placebo. In this trial that we're reporting at uh, the ACC, well, the CARDIA-2, uh, patients who were either had untreated hypertension or those with treated hypertension on one or two medications that were still uncontrolled uh, were then transitioned to background therapy in random fashion with either amlodipine, indapamide, or, or, or olmosartan. Uh, were then followed open label on those therapies for four weeks to, uh, to ensure background blood pressure control. And those patients who had persistent elevation in blood pressure uh, and were adherent to their medicines were then randomized to treatment with salbicerin or placebo. So this 
trial, Cardio 2 is effect investigating the effect of zalbisrin as add-on therapy to some commonly used medication classes that we see in clinical practice dosed at, at, um, uh, at levels that would be expected to provide background reduction in blood pressure. Uh, the primary findings of the trial are that uh, regardless of the background therapy, a thiazide diuretic and dapamide 2.5 milligrams, a calcium channel blocker, amlodipine 5 milligrams, or a potent, potent angiotensin receptor blocker, olmosartan 40 milligrams. Addition of zalbisrin compared with placebo was associated with important reductions in 24-hour ambulatory systolic blood pressure at three months. Uh, the reductions were 10, uh, as much as 12 millimeters in the endapamide arm, as much as... Um, 10 millimeters in the amlodipine arm and as much as four millimeters of mercury uh, in the uh, Almasard arm compared with placebo. Uh, so what we were able to show is that the addition of zalbisrin does appear to have incremental uh, effect in lowering blood pressure over standard commonly used medicines in practice in a hypertensive population that was uncontrolled. Uh, and uh, those effects, if we look at the six month data, uh, do appear to endure to six months at least uh, in the endapamide and amlodipine arms, particularly even though uh, after three months, patients were uh, investigators were allowed to add on additional antihypertensive therapy. So at least some evidence that there is uh, incremental efficacy over standard available therapies and complementary effect in blood pressure lowering. I suppose the other uh, uh, important result is that there is evidence, uh, additional evidence in this trial complementing what we had from phase one and from cardio one of additional safety. Uh, there were uh, no major concerns identified with regard to hyperkalemia, uh, worsening renal function, uh, uh, or hypo serious hypotension, although there were more episodes of mild hyperkalemia and some uh, transient declines in renal function that were seen during the study and more reported cases of low blood pressure. Yeah, in terms of those changes in, in renal function, are they akin to what you might see for you know, after initiation of an ACE inhibitor, for instance? Like, is there reason to actually believe that there could be long-term benefit um, from this type of therapy for renal function? Could they be renal protective? I think that remains to be demonstrated, but absolutely, I think the effects are exactly as you've stated them. There, there's an early decline in, uh, in uh, EGFR that's seen um, in some patients as much as 30%. Uh, but on repeat testing, most of those changes in renal function appear to be uh, attenuated in the zalbisrin patients. So I think much like ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, other drugs active in this axis, we do seem to see some early effect on renal function. But whether, like those agents, there is long-term protection from this approach uh, with regard to renal function, I think we need to explore further in the trials. But the, there is reason to believe that suppression of this axis has value particularly in high-risk renal populations like those with diabetes or uh, proteinuria. In terms of other risks that one might consider, you know, uh, things like angioedema from that um, pathway in particular, um, is there any reason to believe that this drug could pose problems for people who have a history of angioedema with, um, with renin-angiotensin drugs? Right. So, so we haven't seen a signal of concern with regard to angioedema and the experience so far. I, I think one of the reassuring features is that this drug has a targeted action to suppress only hepatic angiotensinogen in the liver. And we think that much of the angioedema-related effects of angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, for example, or nepolysin inhibitors, has to do with their effects on bradykinin metabolism. And since there is a very targeted effect here on angiotensinogen, the uh, gene, uh, the RNA, uh, we we don't think that there should be a signal of, of uh, angioedema, and we haven't seen one so far. And in terms of the prolonged duration of action, I think that that's one of the questions that people have raised, too. You know, what about a patient who then runs into problems with hypotension? Now, of course, it's a relatively um, small study that, that has looked at this so far, but if this was to become more available on a widespread basis, that there's no option really for reversing the therapy, I suppose. Right. So uh, a few notes there. One is that, as you say, it's re we hope it's reassuring that in the experience that's accumulated so far that there hasn't been a serious signal of, se of severe hypotension. But as you know, the trials are relatively short in duration. They're fairly small and have not involved a lot of very high risk patients. Um, I think we need a lot more uh, long term safety data before we can be sure. But the few reassuring things that have been noted so far is in the early phase one experience, there was a component uh, looking at the effect of high-sodium diet on blood pressure in patients treated with zalbisrin, and it does appear that 
with salt loading, there is a, a rescue of the blood pressure lowering effect of zalbisrin. There's also some data from the preclinical experience in animal models that patients treated with albis or the uh, animals treated with albisrin still do respond to conventional presser agents, norepinephrine, um, angiotensin II, uh, volume loading. And then uh, the final piece is that uh, there uh, has been uh, um, work uh, to develop a targeted reversal agent for zalbisrin uh, in the event that more uh, more serious hypotension is important. Well, the blood pressure lo lowering effects are quite impressive, and it, it's great to see, too, that you see some incremental blood pressure lowering on a background of an ARB as well. Um, so I think that that you know, certainly speaks for there being a potential role here for this type of therapy, and especially for perhaps a non-compliant patient, you know, uh, perhaps even for more benefit in, in that particular patient population, too. Yeah, and I, I think the other uh, potential advantage, although we haven't, have, haven't seen um, whether this will translate into any meaningful benefit with regard to cardiovascular outcomes, is the consistency of the blood pressure reduction effect. So we know that when one patient takes an oral medication, that, that as the medication and uh, half-life ex uh, is exceeded, the, the blood pressure tends to rebound. And there's a lot of volatility in blood pressure that we see in patients taking oral medicines in practice, particularly if they miss medicines from time to time. And that blood pressure variability in large data sets does seem to correlate with uh, uh, some risk of worsening outcomes. The more volatility one sees, the more risk there is. One opportunity with RNA interference therapeutics like Zelbisrin is that there is such a consistent effect that we have reductions in blood pressures that endure over the full 24-hour interval. So nocturnal blood pressure is lowered as much as daytime blood pressure. And uh, between visit, there isn't a lot of variability in the amount of blood pressure lowering that's seen. Uh, whether that translates into a meaningful benefit in practice or at any advantage over the other available therapies uh, is, is something we'll have to learn in future. Well, that's, that's very interesting. So, I mean, the last thing I'd like to get your thoughts on, too, is renal denervation, because, you know, I think that people have been perhaps confused by the conflicting evidence that has emerged through the years and, and may not really be sure how that fits in right now for management of patients with, um, with hypertension that seems to be refractory to, to several antihypertensive medications. Yeah. So I think that a lot of the confusion arose really because of the results of Simplicity 3, where the uh, 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 the, an early approach to renal denervation with radiofrequency ablation uh, in its early iteration was associated with no statistical benefit uh, in, the, in that trial. However, subsequent trials of both radiofrequency ablation and more uh, and newer ultrasound uh, methods for doing renal nerve denervation have shown um, convincing evidence of uh, uh, efficacy with regard to blood pressure lowering. Uh, on the order of five to seven millimeters of mercury on average uh, in patients with fairly resistant hypertension on multiple medications. And the FDA has recognized this recently and actually provided approval uh, for regulatory approval for use of renal denervation to treat selected patients with resistant hypertension. So I think we now have it uh, available as a therapeutic option. Uh, it's still a little clear, unclear to me as a clinician exactly which patients are likely to benefit. I think right now we'll follow the lead of the trials uh, and refer those patients, presumably, who have uh, the most treatment-resistant hypertension. Whether there's a role for earlier utilization of that therapy in the populations that we've been discussing with non-adherents or who just prefer not to take as many medications as earlier line therapy, I think that still remains to be seen. Well, thanks for walking us through that. I think, as you say um, very nicely, for a long time, there really hadn't been much to reach for that was new in this space. But I think now between renal denervation and some of these newer therapeutics that are in development, uh, it is a, a very exciting time, I think. Yeah, exciting times in prevention in general, I think. So uh, it's, good, it's good to see an innovation on this end of the spectrum. Well, thanks for joining me today to discuss it. Yeah, thank you. Signing off from Medscape, this is Dr. Michelle Donahue.